Well, if you would like to turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs and chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 8, and I just want to read you one proverb as we open this sermon, and it's Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, where you'll read also on your service sheet there, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I want to talk to you about hate. And this is part five in a series of short, uh, no, a short series of long messages I got that the wrong way around, didn't I? Uh, A a short series of studies uh, working through these marks of genuine repentance. We've covered the fact that in order to genuinely repent, you need to actually see your sin. You'll see the list here on the top of the sheet. Sight of sin, that was the first mark. Then we talked about the need for godly sorrow. If your eyes never see your sin, your eyes are never going to weep over your sins. Uh, You must, however, sorrow for sin if you're going to say that you're repenting genuinely before God. It would be completely um, incomprehensible that someone could genuinely repent without any real sorrow, godly Sorrow. In fact, the Bible puts it very clearly that it is a godly sorrow that produces repentance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, you can look at that sometime. But uh, if you are repenting and you are seeing and sorrowing over your sin, you'll also end up spilling your sin in confession to God, talking to him about what it is that you've done and, and, and also uh, who you are as a sinner. The confession is what um, some of the early church fathers like Augustine called the vomit of the soul. And all the time that you're sick with sin, the confession has to come out. Last week we took some time to think Fourthly, about the reality that along with the sight, sorrow, and confession of sin in any genuine repentance, there is a a genuine sense of shame for sin. And you can see that in the list. Uh, I've uh, unfortunately failed to update the numbers correctly. You will see that we are actually on number five, hatred for sin, Mark 5. Thomas Watson called them six ingredients of the medicine of repentance. I've called them six marks of the real thing, sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, hatred for sin. If you want to know that you're really repenting, um, Here's another mark of the real thing. You have to hate your sin. And when I say that, um, there's going to be a lot of reaction in people's hearts. Uh, Some people will hate what I say. Some people may accuse me of hate speech and talking about hate. I will talk about hate as actually a virtue today. The psalmist said, Oh, you that love the Lord, hate Evil, Psalm 97, 10. I read to you Solomon's words in the book of Proverbs. The Lord himself hates evil, hates sin. And when we are repenting and thinking again, thinking rightly, thinking like God, we ourselves will think the way God thinks about the sin which he says is so wrong and so Evil, And so I ask the question to start with, can you really repent 
And can you really be repenting, truly? Is your repentance for real if you don't hate your sin? If you still love it as something which you know is evil? Well, tonight I want to talk to you about this hatred of sin as something which must be present for you to consider yourself as someone who's genuinely repenting. And I, I want to break it down. I've broken it down on your sheet for you to help you understand it. I'm going to first talk about what hatred of sin is, and also under that heading what it's not. And then I'll spend some time talking about how to know if you hate sin, genuinely. And then we'll think about some reasons to hate sin. And if you're following along in Thomas Watson's book, The Doctrine of Repentance, you'll see that uh, in this study, uh, more so than others, I'm, I'm fairly closely following his breakdown, giving it some different titles and some different wording, but I'm really drawing heavily, as I have been through, through the whole series on that wonderful work by Thomas Watson. I would commend it to you. I cannot commend all his use of Scripture. Sometimes, uh, like some of the uh, by, Christians from a bygone era, he'll, he'll use a verse of Scripture to back up something which is a, a good point from the wrong text. Um, and, and so, you know, I can't commend everything he says in that way, but he says things so well, so wonderfully well, that I wish you could all go and read his book and then you wouldn't have to sit through this sermon series. Um, but let's work through it, shall we? First of all, let's think about what hatred of sin is. Watson spoke about hatred of sin as being a twofold hatred. First, you need to loathe your sin, and secondly, um, you also have an enmity towards your sin. Sin becomes your enemy. Um, it is something that you become set against. It, by loathing sin, Watson says, if a man loathes that which makes his stomach sick, how much more will he loathe that which makes his soul sick? sick. And you can think of that food, can't you? For me, it's brown rice with blue cheese. And that food that you ate before you became sick, that you've not been able to eat for several years since. And whatever that food is, I'm sorry to bring it to your mind, but you have that food and, and you loathe it. There's a, a, there's a deep and settled hatred for that food because it made you sick. And you can tell, really, that God wants us, as his followers, to view sin like that. Why? Well, you can see the words he uses for it. Psalm 119, verse 163. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law, says the psalmist. I hate it. I abhor it. Falsehood lies, deceit. I hate it, says the psalmist. And you reading the scripture should at least get to that point and say, so do I. So do I. And there's something desperately wrong, isn't there? If we can get to a, a place like that and think to ourselves, well, that's foreign to me. Actually, it's interesting, the Bible uses a few different terms for hatred in the Old Testament, a couple of different Hebrew words, shane, it expresses an, an emotional attitude towards um, someone or something where the person is either opposed, that sense of enmity, or detested, like the food, or despised, something um, with which one wishes to have no contact at all, something which might be unclean, and, and that Old Testament word is used to, to say you shall abhor it, you shall detest it as something unclean, something that would contaminate you. And, and, and so in that sense, in the Old Testament usage, this is the um, theological word book of the Old Testament, says that this word is the opposite of love. It's what we would say, love and hate. Uh, and, and, and we say that those are 
complete opposites. Well, that's exactly what we have here. Another Hebrew word used in the Old Testament, uh, ta'av, is similar um, and translated to abhor or to loathe. But here the idea is almost a physical loathing. And I think we can probably relate to that. In the New Testament, Greek word, you like your Greek words, I know, some of you sitting in the front pew. Um, miseo, this is the word that we would take part of to get our, our word misogynist. It's the word I hate in Greek, miseo. And uh, misogynist is someone who hates a woman. Gune is a woman. So miso and gune, uh, miso and gune, and you've got misogynist, and that's what people do in English when they want to make up a word, meaning the hatred of women. It means to dislike strongly, with the implication, and I'm quoting, of aversion and hostility, to hate, to detest. So you get the picture. These are words which um, you could go to an English definition of the word hate and you could find under that English definition, whichever dictionary you went to, the words like detest and abhor and um, be in a state of hostility to, towards and in all of those terms, the implication is that you will reject what you hate. It's, it's something which is kind of inbuilt. The idea that you would welcome something that you abhor is contradictory. Are you with me? You are not friendly towards something that you hate. And so I'm going to say that in, in all of this, the direction of this hatred in, it, it, towards sin, the hatred of sin that is being commended here is primarily inward. It's primarily inward. And, and you get that picture. You go to the New Testament, and, and, and what do you see Jesus saying? You know, before you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye, what are you supposed to do? Take the log out of your own, the beam out of your own. Um, when, you, when you see that your hand or your eye is leading you into sin, cut it off, throw it away, pluck it out, throw it away. What's it speaking of? A rejection, a hatred, a, a strong dislike for anything that would contaminate you, that would lead you into a sin. And, and I must say, straight up, because someone is going to misquote me, misunderstand what I say, what I'm not talking about here is a hatred toward people. Hate is something that I am talking about as a virtue. I am saying that hatred of sin is a virtue. But we don't normally talk about hate as a virtue. We normally talk about hate as the kind of ultimate um, modern crime. Stop the hate. There's a hashtag if you want to go look on, on Twigger, Twitter. Uh, Twigger. I wonder if there is something called Twigger. <laughs> Maybe we should start a new social media group and call it Twigger. Um, we, we all uh, do recognize, however, that hate is a virtue. Everyone accepts hate as a virtue. We, we're happy when judges hate injustice, normally, unless it's to do with us. We'd be happy for bankers to hate greed. We, we'd love politicians to hate lies. And you'd have no problem at all, most of you ladies, if all the girls in the office hated gossip, especially when it was to do with you. Uh, there, these are examples of people hating sin. And we say that's a good thing. And we agree it's a virtue. What is not acceptable, and, and, and this is where we rightly draw the line, is to hate people, to, to have a settled enmity towards an individual, to, to be 
to be in a position where you're saying, I loathe, detest, abhor that person. Now that's, and it's, you take that a step further and say, to hate someone in a particular group. Uh, hatred of women, misogyny, I mentioned it earlier. There's also misandry, which is the hatred of men, which, at least in my experience, is far more common these days than the opposite. Um, but that's just a, you know, it's kind of allowable, isn't it, to hate men? It's kind of popular. I had a, I went to the Oxford dic Dictionary and looked up uh, misandry, and there was a video there. You can go and look at it by a, uh, a very polite-looking lady explaining words that people use today infrequently and this was one of them and she talked about the fact that there was like 2,000 uses to 85 or something like that of misogyny compared to Miss Andre and, and yet when she, she had a little smirk on her face when she said even if it's actually more common and um, smiled away as if to say aren't we Aren't we okay, ladies, <laughs> to uh, to hate men? It is kind of commonly acceptable to hate men, isn't it? But um, racism, another form of hatred against a group, which we would say is rightly considered wrong. It's rightly considered evil to 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 put someone into a group and say. I'm opposed to you, I detest you, I abhor you, I reject you, I'm hostile towards you, I'm against you, I'm your enemy, because you're a part of a group, any particular group. And we could go on with the list of different groups, whatever that may be, um, sexism, ageism, uh, gender issues, whatever that is, if you're actually in a state of enmity towards that person because of it, it would be wrong. And we rightly reject that kind of hatred. And I want to just qualify everything I'm going to say by saying, I am not saying that hatred towards individuals is a virtue. And I have to be careful because um, there are people who, when... I will say something is a sin will interpret that as if I am hating them. There are some people who are so identified with their, the philosophy that goes along with their particular cause that if we reject the thinking associated with their cause, they can feel as though we're hating them. They, they feel identified with their thinking so much that they cannot except disagreement with their philosophy. Feminists who are completely identified with their feminist ideology will maybe interpret you ladies as hating them if you dare to say, actually, no, I believe, I disagree, I believe the, what the Bible says, that God created them male and female, and, and the, the woman was created as a helper for the man. And what the Bible teaches about the, the headship of the husband in the family unit um, as being uh, indicating complementary roles rather than equal roles, if you dare to raise your head above the parapet in the office and admit to that, there will be some people who will say you're engaging in hatred against women. Um, I've put it forwards as if what some of you ladies might dare to say it. Uh, any of you men feel brave enough to, to say that in the office? Misogyny, they say. You're, you're engaging in hatred, the repression, the oppression of women. Similarly, if there, there will be Muslims who with their identification with their, their religious belief that Allah is, not, is the only God and he doesn't have a son, um, and that Muhammad is his prophet, if we as Christians step forwards and say, no, well, actually, I believe what Jesus said, that he is the, the God's son, and I believe that Jesus 
was speaking the truth when he said, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. There is salvation in no other name, says the Bible. I believe that, you say to your Muslim friend, and Jesus is God's son, and suddenly you've got a situation where you're coming into direct contradiction with the whole world view. Some people may interpret that as if your disagreement is hatred. Christians who, unlike the Archbishop of Canterbury last week, are willing to say that gay sex is actually sinful, as defined in the Bible, and give a a straight answer on that question, will be accused of hatred towards gays. Christians who say that in the beginning God created them male and female, and that gender is binary, and that uh, there are only two genders as defined in, in the Bible, will be accused of hatred towards people who want to identify themselves very strongly with their philosophy and their understanding that gender is fluid and non-binary. Well, what do we say to all that? Well, what we say is, is disagreement hatred? When did disagreement become hatred? And, and for us to say, no, we disagree, we believe what the Bible says, um, this is what we believe is truth, and we're going to be willing to speak the truth, um, if... It, that for all of time until now is not has not generally been understood as hatred and and so people may accuse us of hatred but i'm going to say christians it should never be the case it should never be the case a christian is someone who ought to be able to um love his homosexual neighbor by giving him a straight answer to the question without any personal animosity attached. Can I say that? You ought to be able to speak the truth and to say quite plainly, no, I believe gay sex is sin, without any hatred towards that individual. In fact, let me take it one step further. A Christian is someone who, if he's following Christ, can actually love the person who is set against him as his enemy. We will have enemies in this world. Hopefully, you are not the enemy of somebody else normally, but you may have people who make themselves your enemy by setting themselves against you, having a personal hostility towards you, uh, abhorring you, despising you, detesting you, loathing you. And yet, as a Christian, what do you do? You pray for those who persecute you. You bless those who curse you. You do, you do good to those who despitefully use you, said Jesus. That's abuse. And yet you look for some way to overcome evil with good and treat them with kindness. And, and, and that's, like, that's the way for Christians. So we should be willing to lay down our lives for our homosexual neighbors colleagues. This should be our, 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 just our modus operandi. We, we were the enemies of God. We were the people who were set against God, hostile to God, rebels against him, and yet we've had his forgiveness, his blessing. We abused him, but he blessed us, and, and, and that enables us to overcome any desire for uh, revenge, we leave vengeance to God, even if they are abusing us, um, we, we're commanded just to pray for them as, uh, and pray for our persecutors' forgiveness, as Jesus did. So can I just clear that up? That this, this business of hatred, of sin, um, even if it's interpreted as personal hatred, should never be so. And we've got, we, we've got the job now to go so far in our willingness to bless those who curse us and to do good to those who abuse us, that nobody can accuse us rightly of hating them. And Jesus taught that the world would 
know that we're his disciples. How? If we love one another. By our love for one another. The world will know that we are his disciples. Not by our hatred for a particular out group. Whatever that group may be. So let me put it out there. Westboro Baptist style, God hates, and you fill in the blank, is not the Christian message. And it's not our stance as Christians. But that said, every Christian who comes to truly repent should have a holy, settled enmity, loathing, hatred, for sin. Uh, and I'm going to ask the question, what would that look like? Where would it be directed? I, I'll, I'll answer it. The sin we're to hate most and first and foremost is in ourselves. And, and so I, I want to talk to you about this hate and I'm, um, I'm just going to uh, say that uh, if you uh, if, if we're going to if we're going to do this um, as we ought, we will be misunderstood, perhaps. But if we do it first and foremost, directed inwards at ourselves and our own sin, um, then we and and if our lives are characterized by that forgiving love towards others, then we're less likely to be misconstrued. Now, um, number two, how to know if you hate sin. Do you, do you hate sin? Um, how do you know if you, if you really hate sin? I'm sure that every Christian here in the room, when you hear that you should have a holy, settled, and uh, en enmity and loathing towards sin, um, you're secretly troubled. Are you not? Is every Christian troubled? Because deep inside every one of us, we know that somewhere in our, in the recesses of our lives, there is an appreciation for some sin. There is secret hidden love of sin, which if you're genuinely a Christian and a repentant person, you hate. But how do you know if you do hate sin as a, as a definition? Well, uh, Thomas Watson gives us an awful lot of help there, and I'm going to take you through it in my own words. Um, first of all, you, you can know that you hate sin if your heart is set against sin. And I'm not saying... Um, I'm sorry, it, it's not saying I'm intolerant to dairy products, but I just can't stop eating cheese. I love cheese. You know, it's not, it's not saying that. It's, it's not saying meat is murder, but I draw the line at bacon. Um, true hatred of sin is like my wife's hatred for goat's cheese, which is unfortunate for a vegetarian if you've ever shopped for vegetarian food. It's all got goat's cheese in these days. But my wife loathes goat's cheese. And as Watson puts it, no matter how the devil makes the dish, if there's sin in it, you detest it. You detest it. You hate it. You loathe it. Why? Because there's sin in it. So, secondly, you know you hate sin if you hate all sin. Not just one or two sins, like the psalmist, uh, but, sorry, but like the psalmist, who said in Psalm 119, verse 104, I hate every false way. Every false way. Watson said, hypocrites will hate some sins which mar their credit. Isn't that so true? that we can hate certain things that expose us, that humiliate us, that cause us shame or cost us. The gambler can hate his gambling when he's losing. 
but that a true repentant person will even hate the sins that you gain from, the sins that make you win or that make you look good. So you know you hate sin if you hate all sin. Thirdly, you know you hate sin if all of you hates sin. It's not just hating sin in your intellect, but loving it with your affections. <laughs> like the person who says, this is my one vice. <laughs> and they love it. No, you, you really hate sin when you hate it with your head as well as your heart. Or I should say your heart as well as your head. You know you hate sin, fourthly, if you won't make peace with it. I read about a Japanese soldier who was still fighting decades after the end of the Second World War. They found him on an island and no one had managed to <laughs> persuade this person to, to surrender. And he was still fighting. Well, you don't invite um, your hated enemy to propose terms for peace, do you? You, you, you don't bring the, your hated enemy to the table and say, well, let's sit down and talk about how we can work this out and compromise together. That's what you do with someone who you want to be friendly with. But you hate sin when you will refuse to make peace with it, like the old style Northern Irish Protestants and Catholics who committed themselves to no peace agreement. And then finally they made a peace agreement. But in that stage, when they were utter enemies, hating each other, committed, they said, we're never going to share government with them, ever. And, and that's hatred, isn't it? You know you hate sin when you will refuse to share the government of your life with sin. You're not going to sit down at the negotiating table and say, okay, now about this. Okay, well, we'll make some compromises on, on my side. No, you hate it when you won't make peace with it. Finally, you know you hate sin if you hate it in others also. Now, um, this is where I, I wanted to carefully preface ev everything earlier by saying I'm not talking about hatred towards other people. I'm not talking about a settled enmity towards them, a hostility towards them as individuals. I'm talking about now here hating sin in them. And let me illustrate that. If you say you hate adultery, but secretly when you're watching a movie and two people are about to commit adultery, you're willing them to get on with it because you want to enjoy the romantic liaison or the physical, um, physical encounter that you're about to get to watch. Well, you don't hate it, do you? You, you love it. You just don't want to be involved in it yourself. You're happy for other people to be involved in it. If you say you're, you're, you, you hate sexual immorality of any kind and you say it's wrong, but you take delight in it in others, you, you don't hate it. You love it. You just don't want to have the consequences of it in, in your life. Listen to Thomas Watson. Loving of sin is worse than committing it. A good man may run into a sinful action unawares, but to love sin is desperate. What is it which makes swine love to tumble in the mire? It is love of filth. To love sin shows that the will is in sin. And the more of the will there is in a sin, the greater the sin. It's a very scary thing, isn't it? Let me circle back around and just ask you again. Do you hate sin? 
You say, I'm repenting. You say, I'm repenting of this sin. This is where it all gets so practical, isn't it? Because we've all got sins to repent of. Every single person in this room has got sins to repent of. And we've all got sin to repent of. And we say, I'm going to repent of it. And we see it. And I'm hoping you sorrow over it. And I'm hoping you then confess it to God. And, and I'm, I'm really hoping you feel that sense of godly shame for it. But now do you hate it? Think of it, your sin, the one that comes to mind, the ones that come to mind. Do you hate it? Are you willing to make peace with it? You, you don't hate it yet. Are you saying you repent of it, but secretly you still are in love with it? Is your heart still actually set on it? Is it, is it meat is murder, but I'll bend it at bacon for you, whatever the bacon is? Well, if this is your sin and you want to repent of it, you need to know that you need to be settled in your enmity, in your, in your opposition, in your war against that sin. You need to be settled in hostility against it, set against it, loathing it, detesting it, abhorring it, it needs to be to you like something that would make you sick. That would be hatred. And that would be right, wouldn't it? So <laughs> all of us have that sin. I, I, I know that every Christian in the room has got that sin and, and, and there's some stubborn sin that hides away in your life and you, you want to repent of it. You want to, to hate it. Maybe um, there are some present or listening who this is just you throughout. You've never really hated sin. How, how, do you, how do you get to hate sin? How can I help you to hate sin? Why should you hate sin? This is number three on your list. And first of all, this, this is following, again, Thomas Watson's great work um, very closely. Now, sin comes from the devil. Sin comes from the devil. You, you, you know sin comes from the devil originally. Genesis chapter 3, the fall, the, the, the serpent tempted Eve. And she fell, and Adam followed and fell, and we fell. And all the time we fall into sin, we're following our father's who fell into sin, and it all, all boils back to, you could say, the devil. It started with the devil. The devil rebelled against God. And he is set against God. The devil is evil, embodied. And he is set against God, who is love. God who is good. God who is the father of light. God from whom we receive everything that's good and right and true, who's given us everything good for our enjoyment. Every good thing that you in, ever enjoy has come. Every good gift, James says, has come down from the Father of lights. It's God who is the source of joy, peace, happiness, goodness in this world. He gives us the grace. He causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is just the source of everything good. And yet the devil is the one who is set against God. And Jesus said the de of the devil that he is the father of lies, and he's been lying since the beginning, and he's the, the deceiver, you might say. And sin is coming from that stock. 2 Timothy 2, 24, Paul speaks to pastors through Tim Timothy and says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Take that and 
take it onto the street. Anyone that wants to be involved in apologetics, you must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Are you picking up a pattern here? Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape what? The snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> it's kind of true if you're a Christian. Um, the devil hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. That's definitely true if you're a Christian. It's definitely true if you're not a Christian. The devil just hates all of God's creatures. He is the father of lies. And he's intent on dragging as many people into perdition with him as he can. And he's intent on pursuing that by deceiving people, taking them captive to do his will. Recruiting people to fight his battle against a holy God. And so when we join in with any sin, we're joining him with the devil's will. There's a reason to hate sin, isn't there? Secondly, think of how Scripture describes sin. This is um, fearful. Thomas Watson puts it like this. It is dishonoring of God. Romans 2.23, a despising of God, 1 Samuel 2.30, a fretting of God, Ezekiel 16.43, a wearying of God, Isaiah 7.13, a grieving the heart of God, as a loving husband is with the unchaste conduct of his wife, quote, I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which have lusted after their idols. Ezekiel 6, 9. See how Scripture describes sin. And isn't that a good reason to hate it? You're the person who could love something which is so well described as being abhorrent by God. God hates it. He puts it out there for us to see what sin is like. And shouldn't we hate it too? Thirdly, it's worse than anything else that can happen to you. And um, this is really quite remarkable. Watson points out that the psalmist was able to say, Psalm 119, verse 71, it's good for me that I was afflicted. Sin is worse than you being afflicted in any way. It's worse for you to fall into sin than it is to fall into sickness. James chapter 1 verse 2 and um, following sort that one out for us, don't they? James said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And stead let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So here we are, and we're walking along the road, and suddenly, wham, a, a trial, a testing, a, 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 a trouble, a temptation, as it were, of, of any kind that just comes upon you. Suddenly you're surrounded by them. The word here is you fall among them. You, you, uh, the same word used of, of the, the, the uh, man on the road who fell among thieves. And here you fall among trials. 
You're just suddenly surrounded by trials of any kind. Paul says, that, but the Christian says, hang on a minute. No, when that happens, when the worst happens in this life, the worst happens. The letter comes with the diagnosis. The, the email comes with the end of your job. The, you, you name it. You fill in the blank as to what the worst would be. Your fiancé abandons you at the altar. You, you, I mean, you, I don't know how, how far you want to go with the worst. But the worst happens. What does James say? Testing your faith. Let's testing of your faith works or produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God is doing something so that He's perfecting you, He's changing you, He's working, God is working on you. This is all happening because God is working on you. God is sanctifying you. I mean, that's something to actually rejoice about, says James. And so he says, count it all joy. Count it pure joy when it happens. Woo, a trial. <laughs> what's, God, what's God got in it for me? What a thing to be able to say. But you can't say that when you fall into sin. Hebrews 12, however, does teach you that discipline is better than sin, doesn't it? Because even when God disciplines you for your sin, we read that he only disciplines, Hebrews 12, 6, who? Those he loves. And chastises everyone who he receives. This is a sign so you're like you're being disciplined by God. But this is a sign that God loves me and accepts me as a son. <laughs> so discipline is not as bad as sin. Persecution, you say, well, I could, I, could, I could cope with it if it wasn't for the pressure at work. But hang on a minute, persecution, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 12, rejoice, rejoice, and jump for joy. That's the, my translation. I think it was the NIV as well. Jump for joy. Rejoice exceedingly, exuberantly. You should be hopping up and down when someone persecutes you. Why? You just won the spiritual lottery. Great is your reward in heaven, says Jesus, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You say, but hold on a minute, someone's writing a blog about me, and they've defamed me, and they're lying. It's all lies. And I'm going to lose my job, or I'm going to lose my friends, or... Nobody, nobody at church is ever going to believe me or, or whatever it is. You just won the spiritual lottery. God knows the truth. And he's the rewarder of all. The persecution is just part of storing up an amazing reward for you. It's you. That's a whole lot better than sin, isn't it? Well... Those are just a few reasons. I'm going to listen to Thomas Watson, who goes on to say, Compare sin with hell, and you shall see that sin is worse. Torment has its epitome in hell, yet nothing in hell is as bad as sin. Hell is of God's making, but sin is not of God's making. Sin is the devil's creature. The torments of hell are a burden only to the sinner, but sin is a burden to God. In the torments of hell, there is something that is good, namely the execution of divine justice. There is justice to be found in hell, but sin is a piece of the highest injustice. It would rob God of his glory, Christ of his purchase, the soul of its happiness. Judge then if sin is not a most hateful thing which is worse than affliction or the torments of hell. Well, I, I don't know if that's helpful. Do you hate your sin? 
I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to come back and just think about your sin again and ask that question. I should hate it. Do I hate it? It is helpful to think back through that that sin of yours is the spawn of the devil. That it's taking you into the devil's trap to do his will. It's useful to think about it if you want to hate your sin, to think about it in the terms that Scripture uses to describe it, a dishonoring of God, a despising of God, a fretting of God, a wearying of God, a grieving of God's heart. And it's helpful to realize that it's worse than anything that could happen to you. So do you hate it? Do you hate it? God hates it. God hates your sin. If you're a Christian today, nothing demonstrates to you more the hatred of God for your sin than what happened on the cross. There on the cross, the wrath of God was poured out upon his own son. It pleased the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. It pleased God to do that. He, on the cross, poured out his holy anger with your sin. And we sing, the Father turned his face away. Oh, God, oh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, cried Jesus upon the cross. And darkness covered the earth. And then he died. He had to go to the end. Because your sin is that bad. So Christian, can you love your sin? Can you love that sin? And let me ask you, if you're not a Christian today, can you see why, if you do not repent of your sin, God must punish you for your sin? It's either Christ takes the punishment for you or you bear the cost yourself. And it's either heaven or hell. And if you insist on having your sin, it will be the thing that takes you to hell to face God's justice. That's enough to make you hate it, isn't it? Todd Friel summarized uh, repentance wonderfully in a tweet. Not all tweets are wrong. Repentance is not perfection. Repentance is the attitude that says, I hate the things that killed the one who died for me. If nothing else does it for you, to think that Jesus died for your sins. And can you love them? Father, we pray that you would make in a, work in us a holy hatred for sin. Deal with us, Lord, to loathe it in ourselves first and foremost. Lord, we pray that we would also um, feel what you feel and not rejoice in that sin in others. Lord, we pray that we would always be like you, like the God who causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous, 
like the God who is patient with us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We pray that you would work in us a patient, loving kindness towards even people who would be hateful and set themselves against us. Lord, we pray that you would give us great grace to love them as you have taught us. And even in the church, Lord, when people curse us, enable us to bless them and to love them in return. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.